this week, I went online and did some scouring of the internet in order to find the 10 most common New Year's resolutions. Worked hard scouring the internet for five minutes, only to discover that the Baltimore Sun had scoured it for hours, saving me a lot of work. The top 10 New Year's resolutions of 2013, in order. Now some of these you may have made or may be planning on making. Some of these you may have made before or know somebody who has made them. In order from 1 to 10, lose weight, quit smoking, save more money, drink less alcohol or quit drinking, Exercise more. Volunteer more or help others. Reduce or manage debt. Reduce or manage or manage stress. Spend more time with family and friends. And number 10, learn something new. Now, what's interesting is that list pretty much remains the same every year. Which leads to the other list. The 10 most commonly broken <laughs> but, uh, New Year's resolutions. I won't read them all to you because nine of them are the top 10 made. Are the top 10. Only one of them is different. Travel to new places. Well, that can be expensive, so no wonder people break that. But of these nine, most of uh, these top 10 resolutions made each year, uh, nine of them are broken. And so often they make the top 10 list. The other one is in the top 25. My, how good we are at keeping our promises. <laughs> this is why I don't make New Year's resolutions. I know I'm going to break them. I did, I did one year. One year I actually made a resolution. I, when was it? 2007, 6, 8, uh, two years ago. I actually made a resolution to reduce the amount of Dr. Pepper I drink. That lasted a week. Now, I noticed I said reduce, not quit. Um, but you know, I have a good reason, a very good reason. You see, I was going into the PhD program and I had to spend a lot of countless hours at the library doing a lot of research and I didn't get a lot of sleep at night because we don't have kids and so I was tired and I needed to stay awake. Dr. Pepper has lots of caffeine, so I, I needed, anybody buying this? <laughs> Well, this morning earlier they did. Y'all know art? What's that? <laughs> yeah. No We always have excuses for why we don't do what we have promised to do. Always have excuses. Always have justifications. Because we always, every year, we people always make a promise. I'm going to improve my life here or there or somewhere else or in this area and that area. And we inevitably break it. We don't do it. When you can't fix your life, I can't fix my life. Well, we can tweak it here and there, but the truth is, we cannot change our life on our own. Don't try. To do it on your own. I repeat, don't try to do it on your own. So before you make a New Year's resolution, I'm um, hoping you haven't yet, so before you do, turn to Nehemiah, chapter 10. We're going to look at the end of the chapter, verses 28 through verse 39 of chapter 10. In Nehemiah 10. Now, normally I preach through books. We haven't been doing that with Christmas time, which is one of the times I normally don't do it. But the next few weeks, I'm also not going to be doing it. I'm doing a, if you want to call it a series, a series on getting the Christian life right. Why? Because <laughs> it's going to conclude January 20th. The 1X Outreach, which if you're wondering what 1X finally is, I know you've probably seen it here and there. Come on the 20th to the fellowship, you'll learn all about it. But in order to 
do that, we have to begin here in Nehemiah. Now I'm going to first summarize Ezra and Nehemiah for you. Two whole books summarized. Hebrews were in exile. Cyrus comes to power, says, I'm going to send you home because Yahweh has told me to. And it's interesting, interesting that he gives credit to Yahweh. He doesn't say my, my deity that I worship. No, he says, by name, God, Yahweh, has said, send you home, so I'm sending you home. He gives credit to the living God. And so they go home, and Nehemiah and Ezra lead it. Ezra, the spiritual leader, Nehemiah, the political leader, served a couple of terms as their governor out there. And they rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall. But they come to a point where Nehemiah stands up and opens up the law, the scriptures, and begins to read it. Word by word, hour after long hour. And during these countless hours of him standing there reading the word of God, at least the first five books, maybe more, as he's reading this, people are going through two positions. One of them is standing, a lot of the time they're standing there for these hours, hands lifted up, palms up. Between that and being on their knees with their faces on the floor, you may have seen a Muslim praying, that type of position. Back and forth between this for hours as the word of God is being read. Now I want to ask, is there anybody in here who's willing to stand up as I begin reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and so forth? Any takers? Want to stand as I begin just reading? No. They did it. That's okay. I wouldn't want to do it either. But they were reading the word. And that had to happen. They were not used to that. But God used this time. God used the reading of his word to move them. And their hearts were broken. The Holy Spirit came and said, I'm going to convict you of your sin. And they were convicted. And it wasn't just a one-time emotional response there on the spot. This breaking occurred day after day after day. It went on. And the people came back and said, we need to repent. And they repented of their sins and the sins of their forefathers. Which is interesting. But they repented. They came to God and said, we repent of our sin. And a promise was made. Bringing us to Nehemiah chapter 10. Verses 28 through 39 comprises the end of the promise, the, what they made with the people. Beginning in verse 28, it reads, Now the rest of the people the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge of un knowledge and understanding, I said to say all the believers, are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a curse and, a, and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant. Now, this curse wasn't saying, hey, God, come judge us right now. What this was, was them saying, we recognize that if we disobey, judgment is coming. We will be punished for our sins. And we accept that. We humble ourselves before you, God, and we accept whatever you say. Whatever you choose to do, we are willing to accept it. We willingly accept humble ourselves at your feet. You are God. But not just saying we take on a curse. They make an oath to walk in God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to observe all the commandments of God, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. Now, ordinances, statutes, law, sound a bit redundant. But there's a technical difference between them. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.45 actually outlines some of that technical differences. Essentially, here's what it is. The law, I mean, is all of it, 
The commandments are the rules, ordinances are judicial pronouncements, and statutes are permanent decrees. Suffice it to say this, they looked at God and said, God, we promise to do everything you have told us to do. If you say do it, we're going to do it. If you say don't do it, we won't do it. Whatever you say, God, that's what we're going to do. We are going to obey you completely. And then they begin to outline some specifics. Some specific things that they are going to do. Beginning in verse 30. And that we will not give our daughters to the people of the land, or take their daughters for our sons. As for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also place ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. There's your tithing. For the showbread, for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. Likewise, we cast lots for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites, and the people, so that they might bring it to the house of our God, according to our fathers' households, at fixed times annually, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. And that they might bring the first fruits of our ground, and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually, and bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons, and of our cattle, and the firstborn of our herds, and our flocks, as it is written in the law, for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God. We will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the first of every tree, as the fruit of every tree, the new wine and the oil to the priests at the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithe of our ground to the Levites, for the Levites are they who receive the tithes in all the rural towns, essentially the local pastors. The priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the sons of Israel and their and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers. There are the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers, and the singers. Thus we will not neglect the house of our God. Now, why did I read all of that detail? Because we don't do a lot of that stuff. This is, these are things prescribed in the law. So why go through it all? Because I want you to see the detail that they are going into. The extent of their obedience. What they were saying is, God, anything you ask, I will do. Anything you command, I will do. Absolute obedience. They went back to God. Now there's something interesting in all of this. These are not things that are... That are communal completely. These are individual acts. It wasn't we as a people will do this. It wasn't we as the nation will do this. It, will, it, it was I as an individual will do this. I will obey. I will follow. I will humble myself. It was an individual act. You see, they recognized that if they wanted to restore their nation, if they wanted to restore their culture, if they wanted to restore their people, if they wanted to fix the things around them, if they wanted to fix the environment in which they lived, and I don't, I don't mean the trees and the grass, I mean the surroundings in, in their lives. If they wanted to fix all of that, they knew they had to change themselves. Which meant they had to go back to God. Now, there's two philosophies on how to impact society. One philosophy argues, and this one goes back about 100 years. It was started around in the late 1800s, became popular in the early 1900s. A philosophy that says if you want to see individuals uplifted, see individuals saved, see individuals transformed, see individuals restored and 
and, and, and be all that they are created to be, then we must change their environment, change their culture, because we're products of our culture and our environment. And so we have to change the things around them, and as we save culture, as we save the community, as we save the collective, the people will just come along. That philosophy is actually based a lot on Darwin. It's known as the social gospel, uh, still advocated today by the World Council of Churches. And by the way, my dissertation is covered in this, that's why you kind of know about it. But there's another philosophy. This philosophy argues if you want to change the culture, if you want to see, see things around us, see the, the community be restored, individuals have to be saved, and as the individuals get their lives right with God, the community will come along. Because the individuals are getting right with God. That one's biblical. Oh, by the way, the social gospel is being dubbed a heresy. What the Hebrews realized, and what they were saying here is, it's not about us, it's about me and my relationship with God. Me and my obedience to God. If I want to change my life, I have to get right with God. And they looked and said, you commanded all these things, God. And if you want to go through all the details of all the law, it's very, very detailed. But they said, you know what, God? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. You commanded it, we obey. And if we don't obey, you will judge us, and we accept that. In verse 39, the end of it, summarizes their priority. Thus, we will not neglect the house of our God. And this is referring specifically to the temple, but what they had in mind is this. We will not neglect the work, the ministry, the service, the worship of God. We will not neglect God. Their priority was God. Now God teaches us that all of these things that they outline, all of these things that they mention, Jesus said are summarized in two laws. <coughs> Love God. <coughs> How many times do we have we ourselves or do we know somebody who's made a resolution to be a better Christian? Be a better church door. Be a person who's more like Jesus. Uh, it's probably just like the lose weight, save money, others that get broken. I'm a good Christian. I'm just like Jesus. Then we go to Sunday school and gossip and, or go around the neighborhood and gossip and of course we justify it with oh, but so let's pray for them. And now it's a prayer request. Not gossip, right? It's still gossip. But I'm a good Christian, just like Jesus. Talking to your friend, or your neighbor, or family member, or somebody you just passed by, and the topic of spirituality comes up. Chance to tell them about what you believe, about what Jesus did, but you, you remain silent. You don't want to offend them. I'm just like Jesus. Chance to serve and then help someone else grow to be a strong Christian. Help them know Jesus more. Help them mature as a Christian. But you don't really have time for that. You've got other things to do. Hobbies. TV. Something that's interfering. Sorry, God. You're just going to have to wait till I'm ready. I'm just like Jesus. One more resolution. Not because it's impossible to do, but because it's impossible for us to do without God. What's interesting is this. Before the Hebrews could come and say, we promise to do this and that, we promise to obey, the first thing they had to do 
was repent of their sin. They had to repent of their sin. And the first thing they said was, we put ourselves under the curse, not we promise to do this and that. They began with repentance. Humbling himself before God, saying, God, I failed you here, I failed you there, my life is just a sin, God, forgive me of my sin. Please, God, forgive me. And they accepted that forgiveness. And God did forgive them, and God blessed them. Out of this awakening, things happened. The people were blessed, they prospered. And believe it or not, people came to faith. Because of what God did through people who said, Father, forgive me. And help me be what you've asked me to be. Help me to love you and to love others the way you've asked me to do. But too often when we look at our lives, we decide, I know what I've been. I know where I'm going. I know, I know what's good. And we decide to look back and try to regain what was past. Or sometimes we decide to wallow in, in the darkness of our past. And we can't move forward looking back. Tony Evans, just a couple days ago, posted on Facebook a quote that I thought was wonderful. He wrote, You can't start the next chapter in your life if you keep rereading the last one. Walk into 2013 expecting great things from God. He loves you. He loves you. God loves you. That's why Jesus laid down his life. On that cross. Because he loves you. That's why he rose again on the third day. Because he loves you. But in order for us to make a resolution to be like Jesus and to follow God obediently, we must first go to God and say, Forgive me. And then we can go to God and say, God, I will follow you. But it begins by coming to the foot of the cross and looking up and seeing the Savior on that tree. See the blood dripping off his feet onto the ground. Paying the price of death that we all deserve for the sins that we commit. And then look at the empty tomb of the Savior who rose again who spoke to those two men on the road to Emmaus. The living God. And say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Forgive me for my transgressions and lead me not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go back to God. Before you make a resolution that you're probably not going to keep, go to God and say, God, change me. Transform me. Let 2013 be better than 2012. Let 2013 be a year where we truly, really, genuinely follow our Savior in whatever 